Hello. All right. My watch just tipped over to 7 o'clock, so I guess we can get started. Here's your gavel. Welcome to the uh, Budget and Finance Committee meeting, Shippensburg Area School District. I am going to turn the time over to Mrs. Lentz. All right. Just click it. It's on the other side. Okay, it's working. Working now. <coughs> okay, thank you. All right, so tonight we have a really full agenda. Uh, we're going to start with uh, reviewing um, like considerations, keeping in mind where we are, um, where, why we are where we are financially, and keeping those things in mind as we move through the 23-24 budget process and future budgets. We're also going to review our debt service, our building budgets, the curriculum budget, athletics, maintenance capital outlay only because we had already reviewed the regular maintenance budget, the Franklin County Career Tech Center budget, a revised personnel list. I uh, want to talk about per capita revenue with you this evening, bring a uh, fourth uh, new idea, as well as an updated summary of revenue and expenses, uh, looking at the implication to our taxpayers looking at future economic growth, and then discussing a resolution uh, that PASBO is asking multi-county school districts to approve um, so they can <coughs> advocate for legislative ch changes for us. And I'll get into more details with that item. All right, so to begin with, like I said, as we plan uh, for the 23-24 budget and for, for future years, we need to keep in mind the various needs of our school district, as well as the lack, lack of adequate funding from the state and federal governments. Um, so this slide, although not all inclusive, um, I'm highlighting some concerns uh, that we need to keep in, in our mind. And some of them are not in our control. So just you know, starting at the top, unfunded mandates. Of course, this is something that is not in our control and that the state has not funded us adequately um, some of the unfunded mandates, as we always talk about, is PEASERS. The PEASERS rate continues to increase, and it remains at a very high level. Uh, cyber charter schools, there's no funding, yet that money, when a student um, goes to an outside cyber charter school, the district is forced to pay those expenditures. Uh, also, you know, the state's not keeping up with the basic education and special education funding formulas. Our special education costs continue to rise, yet the funding we get from the state does not. And as you all know, uh, several years ago, uh, the state put a moratorium on plan con, and that was reimbursement towards uh, capital projects. So we no longer get state funding for our uh, capital project needs as well. And as we talked about before, being in a multi-county school district, they ha part of the uh, equation is they have to equalize our millage rates because of the assessed values not being equal in e either county. So, of course, that has caused um, harm to the districts that have to sit in two multi-counties, and that's where the resolution that I just mentioned is going to come into play as we ask PASBO to help advocate for legislative changes um, to that equalization. And again, I'll get into more detail, details later that show um, how we have been impacted in that um, equalization formula. And then, obviously, uh, we have, we have unrealized or un lost real estate tax revenue from prior years when not raising taxes to our full potential. Uh, Shippensburg Area School District is in the top 100 underfunded school districts. Uh, we continue to see increased enrollments. Uh, most districts are actually facing a decrease and we're increasing our enrollments. We have plenty of future capital needs, as we all know, that um, cannot be funded with uh, level debt service. Um, budgeting level debt service payments. Uh, we have started with having one resource officer in the district, but if you know there's potential for more, you know where's that funding going to come from? Uh, we have hired four seventh grade teaching positions for next school year. Uh, currently, that's being funded out of our fund balance, so we need to keep that in mind uh, for future years that we can absorb those into the budget as we continue to back down uh, fund balance for those positions. We all know that we uh, could do more for competitive wages for some of our staff. Uh, we have 
been using some ESSER money for coaching and interventionist positions. We'd love to keep those. Um, but again, you know, we need the funding to do so. Uh, we continue to see a rise in our special education cost. And um, for those of you that weren't at the district, I wasn't here either. Um, but back in 2010, 11 timeframe, when the pension crisis hit, uh, the staff either uh, cut hours or eliminated positions, and there was 102 positions affected. And as you know, even though we're making small progress in bringing back new positions to the district, we have social workers, ag teacher, noontime aides, we still are not back up to the level of staffing that we had back before the pension crisis hit. So, so despite all those concerns, <laughs> Um, you know, because of the fiscal responsibility of the board um, and some, some forethought, you know, we're not in a terrible position, but we certainly have, you know, more than our average share of, of things that we need to consider as we budget forward, okay? I have shared this um, in the past with the boarding community, but just wanted to share it again and revisit this as just a reminder, when we compare <coughs> Shippensburg um, Area School District to um, our other school districts in Cumberland, Franklin County, uh, our district's per pupil uh, expenditures is lower than most school districts. Again, that goes back to not having the adequate funding to spend on par with uh, our surrounding school districts. So for Cumberland County, uh, we're second to the lowest. Um, based on our 21-22, that's the last fiscal year we have uh, to compare to with other districts, uh, we were at a per pupil expenditure of $16,860. So you can see Big Spring is uh, leading in terms of the Cumberland County School Districts on what they spend per student. If we were to spend on par with Big Spring School District, we would need to spend an additional $19.7 million. Um, if just another comparison, if we were to spend on par with Carlisle, we need to spend an additional $7.7 .7 million. Um, comparing us to some of our Franklin County school districts, if we were to spend on par with Tuscarora school district, we need to spend an additional 6.5 million. And even just to spend on par with Chambersburg, who is just one above us, we need to spend an additional $2.4 million. So, so just some comments on this. Some of this is <laughs> driven by enrollment. Um, you know, the, the smaller your, you know, if, you're, if your enrollment is decreasing, you know, you're, you're gonna largely keep the same services that you have, but your per, per uh, student spending would obviously go up. So this does fluctuate with, with our enrollment, um, you know, but it, it is, I think, enlightening to see where we sit um, in two counties. So again, just additional information to show how underfunded Shippensburg Area School District is. This comes from fundourschoolspa.org website. So according to this organization, uh, Shippensburg Area School District falls short about $15.1 million to provide adequate services to our students. Or as they break it down, in other words, if you look at it on a per student basis, we shortchange um, each student $4,339 annually. Um, and I'll just jump in here. Like, this is not to lay at the feet of this board. This, this is a statewide problem, um, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with the funding from the state level, okay? Um, you know, the, this isn't to say this board or previous boards are, you know, doing a disservice to kids. You know, the state does have, um, as that court case that just recently came down indicates, um, that, you know, the, the funding formula in Pennsylvania is, is out of whack. Um, and, and the, you know, I met with uh, legislature, uh, some le legislators uh, last Monday and the, the week before, to, you know, a, a, as many superintendents in the area did as part of Advocacy Week to kind of highlight this back to them. They are aware of it, um, and, and I was slightly encouraged that they um, are hearing it um, and know they have to do something different because of that court case. So, uh out of 500 school districts, uh, SASD ranks 41st of the most underfunded school districts, with number one being the most underfunded school district, and that is actually Reading School District. So just another um, comparison when you compare us to other school districts. Um, this is our millage rate comparison. 
So again, this is it shows how the equalization of millage rates can play a part in us not being able to keep on par with um, our other districts, as well as always not taxing to our full potential. So as you can see, uh, Shippensburg for the Cumberland County side, we are in the third lowest. So, you know, the other districts, if you were to live in those other districts, it's gonna cost you as a taxpayer more money to live in those districts. Um, and then uh, for the Franklin County side, we're next to the lowest on the list in terms of our millage rates. Um, so again, you know, if you lived in the Franklin County, it would cost the taxpayers a lot more money to live in one of those, those um, districts. So what does that look like? If we're looking at potentially uh, talking about increasing taxes to the index, over on the side, you can see for 23-24, if the board would tax to the index, the Cumberland County millage rate would be 13.4820. So if you were trying to apply this to this list, assuming no none of these districts would increase their tax rate, we would we would slide up one on the Cumberland County side, but that means you know there's still at least um, five school districts that have millage rates higher than uh, Shippensburg School District. And then if you look down on the Franklin County side, if we would increase taxes to the index, our millage rate would be 100.0525. And again, we would remain at where we're at if no other school districts increase their tax rate. Lindy, uh, the, um, even if we didn't raise taxes at all, people would still get a tax system from the county and the state, correct? That, that's separate? The tax, and we increase taxes to the, to the index, correct? Say that again. People's taxes would still, they still get, if we, if we so we're out of the equation, they still get taxes. We don't, we don't, we're not the only one causing the raise, I guess I want to ask for taxes. You know? I'm sorry, Mr. Scott, what yeah. are you trying to, I'm I mean, trying to, uh, are you referring to the school taxes? Yes. The, the, refer, like the, Whenever they get their taxes, they get like one for real estate, one for like what's the well, property, okay. your school tax. I think he's. Are you talking about two? There's st county. Th there, there are other. County. There are other taxes factored in. So, our school tax we cause that. Correct. Or, correct. Okay. That's a local decision. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so looking at our historical um, tax increases, again, I had shared this previously with the board, but what, what this illustrates, it's, it's twofold. It illustrates the compounded um, revenue loss for years when we did not utilize um, our full taxing authority. It also points out that um, even when we do raise taxes, um, that unfortunately, the Franklin County side with this whole equalization of millage rates, um, their his, they had a, hit a historical high millage rate of 102.7083 in the 16-17 fiscal year. And so as you can see that uh, through the years, um, their uh, millage rate has either increased or decreased. And so again, it, one of the impacts in this is the equalization between the two counties. So this is where we really need the legislatures to change the law concerning how this equalization of millage rates works. Um, so we are not harmed. And if we decide not to increase taxes at all, that's, that's usually when we find that the Franklin County millage rate will fall is when we haven't increased taxes or we do a small increase. Um, there was only one year in which the Cumberland County rate went down since the 11-12 school year. If you look past that, don't compare to that, that's when um, the county reassessed. So that's why it went from 13.55 to 10.01. That was the reassessment year. But if you look at all other years for Cumberland County, the Cumberland County only fell once. But if you look at the Franklin County side throughout the years, they actually had their uh, millage rate drop four times. And again, if the board would choose to increase taxes to the index, um, the millage rate is 100, what was that, 100.0525. Um, so we are still um, under the historical high of 102.7083 for the Franklin County residents. And, and again, no, no one is indicating, you know, that, that we, from the past 17 years that, you know, we would have gone to the index every year. 
Um, j just knowing that, that when we don't or we choose not to go at all, that has a ripple effect um, throughout time. Um, you know, and, and I think our goal is to not just think about the board now, um, but to set future boards up for success. Um, so there isn't the, the, the scramble and the, the stress, um, you know, to, to just run programs. Christy, can you explain the $28 million number down there? Because I think it's important for the community to understand that so, number. So when um, past boards have either not increased taxes at all or uh, had increased taxes slightly but not to the index, uh, that compounds year over year um, because uh, you're by not raising your millage rate, that's compounding because then your base starts lower every year. So by doing so, that's where that 28.6 million comes into play of the compounded lost revenue um, when we don't go to the index or close to the index. So essentially it's money we left on the table. That is correct. Th that is the ceiling number mm -hmm. we left on the table. You know, obviously some, some you know. But part they, before they did the index, they could raise taxes what they wanted. <laughs> Correct. It was done. Yeah. That, I mean, that's part of the reason why the index came in. Right. I think that's your point. Because they were. <laughs> yeah. Right, but that number came from 2007 to now. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's from when the Act 1 index came into play. And, and not to say that every any board over 17 years would constantly raise to the index. That, that is indeed the ceiling number. Um, but, but having some variation of that in our budget today w would certainly be helpful, would have been helpful. So just keep all this in mind as we move forward. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the 23-24 budget. So as we all know, um, in 2019, our debt service payments, um, well, from, 2019 to 2021, they dropped slightly. And then from the 21, 2021, 2020, 21, 22 school year, then they um, dropped in over half. Um, so you can see in 1920, we had debt service payments at 3.66 million. We have continued to budget that annual debt service payment so we can continue to borrow these large amounts of money for our future projects. So I'm gonna jump down to the pink line item. That's the current school year for 22-23. So if budgeted revenues and expenditures would match, um, then what this is saying is because we have budgeted 3.66 million in annual debt service, but our payment for the 22-23 school year is only 1.37 million, that will allow us to put at least 1.96 million into fund balance for future projects. So then moving on down to the 23-24 fiscal year, we have included an estimated amount for our new borrowing, should the board approve this at the upcoming meeting. And so what does that look like? Our payments for 23-24 would be approximately 21, 20.13 million, not 21, sorry, 2.13 million, uh, compared to what we're continuing to budget at 3.66 million. That's a difference of about 1.5 million. Again, if expenditures and revenues remain the same as budgeted, we'd be able to put that amount of money into fund balance for future capital projects. So, so that's certainly a decision made by previous boards that have helped us um, and allowed us to, to grow and, and try to address our facility needs. Moving on to our building budgets, um, most years uh, we ask our building budgets to keep their their allotments level, and we have done that for this year with one exception. Um, with the um, request for new teachers, we have allowed or have allotted additional money uh, towards those buildings. So we gave James Bird $200 because that's what they budget for their uh, first and second grade positions. Um, each teacher gets $200, same way with Nancy Grayson. Uh, the intermediate school, should the board approve um, a new star teacher, uh, $200 there for that teacher to spend for classroom materials. Um, no increase for G Blues, um, as there's no um, anticipated uh, new staffing at that building at this point. Our middle school is getting 
uh, new seventh grade positions. Um, so we looked at what uh, the average teacher gets there for science, social studies, for the science, social studies, math, math, and DLA. 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 There we go. Thank you, Sherry. So. Um, <coughs> Based on what those teachers' allotment gets, we're asking to increase the middle school budget by $1,350. And then the high school budget with the new VO Ag teacher, um, the driver's ed rental car, they are asking to be able to have that 12 months out of the year instead of nine months. And they are seeing an increase in their printing costs for students. So allowing the high school to have an additional increase to their budget of $6,915 or overall adding $8,865 to the 23-24 budget. As for curriculum, um, we're showing a small decrease over last uh, fiscal year of $154, otherwise asking that the curriculum budget stay flat for the year. Middle school athletics, uh, there is a small increase of $855. Um, that would we would transfer from the general fund to help um, cover the expenses in the athletic fund for our middle school sports and the main uh, increase is due to an increase in official pay and reconditioning of the football helmets there was a small decrease in the supply line item for our athletics at the high school, um, asking the general fund to transfer an additional $6,190 compared to last fiscal year. Uh, the increase is mainly due to an increase in official pay, ambulance fees, game help, and tournament fees. There's a small increase um, in student accident insurance, and then uh, there's a decrease in the supply line items. Uh, they have the uniforms on a replacement cycle, so there's a small decrease uh, based on the uniform, replace, the uniform replacement cycle. Let me ask one question. Um, on the middle, in the middle school athletics, um, under the revenues, they not have an activity fee? I'm almost certain they did. It's like $20 less than a high school activity fee. I can certainly check with Mrs. Fannis, but um, they only showed gate receipts as revenue for the middle school account. Gate receipts are on the high school. Athletics, middle school, and revenue. <coughs> middle school actually gets some gate receipts too. So we can certainly um, check with Ms. Fannis and, and get back with the board. Okay. So this brings us to our facilities uh, capital outlay. Um, like I said before, at the last budget um, presentation, we looked at the regular budget for facilities and maintenance. So the items one through nine, we are categorizing them as high priority um, projects that we would like to see get done in the 23-24 fiscal year. And then we listed um, two items in the medium priority capital maintenance project. So starting with number one, um, we're asking that we need to move forward on our uh, camera project. And so right now we have just as a placeholder $320,000 uh, for the camera projects. Uh, this would be funded out of either grant or school district money. If you recall through the um, ESSER ARP funds, we have $152,302 we can spend on cameras. If you recall, Mr. Burt had made a motion that SASD match this number, uh, which the board did approve. And then Mrs. Woodall had applied for a grant through the Office of Safe Schools where we got uh, funds for our school resource officer and we also got an additional 50,000 that, that can be used for cameras. So that brings that total to 354,604 that we have available to spend in the camera project upgrade. Um, Mr. Kreitz is also asking that we replace the water heaters at our middle school and intermediate school at an estimated cost of 30,000 and that would come out of the capital um, maintenance fund balance line item. Uh, the electrical switch gear cleaning and inspection, we're asking for that to be done district wide at a cost of $69,114, again, to come out of capital maintenance fund balance. 
um, just so the board is aware, the, these inspections and clean, cleaning should happen on a rotation every three to five years. This has not been done since COVID, so we are recommending bringing all of our buildings up to speed. And then going forward, Mr. Kreitz would budget one per year in his regular maintenance budget as this is a reoccurring expense. We are also asking the, to replace the high school generator at a cost of $387,778, again, to come out of the capital maintenance fund balance line item. If you recall, um, during the middle school construction project, we made a recommendation not to redo the redundant electrical line and that we would be better off if we did a high school generator um, so when the power does go out, it can um, support more um, I want to say outlets or electrical needs in the building. So currently, the generator uh, cannot um, maintain our um, high school walk-in freezers and refrigerators. So when the electricity goes out, that's always a concern um, that we don't have f food loss. Um, and then there's, uh, again, other areas that uh, this generator would allow us to have up and running that the current generator cannot support. According to Chad, the, that generator is on its last legs and takes like very specific knowledge to be able to to run, which may or may not include hitting it with wrenches. I can't really speak to it, but it's possible. We are also asking to reseal and repaint the James Bird and Nancy Grayson parking lots and playgrounds at an estimated cost of twenty-seven thousand. Again, that would come out of capital maintenance fund balance. Uh, we would like to develop a calm down room at our Nancy Grayson Elementary School at a cost of 20,000. Again, come out of the capital maintenance fund balance line item. If you recall this next line item, the next gen, uh, it's our building automation control system. Uh, we have slowly one by one uh, replaced out Siemens with the next gen in all of our buildings. We are currently doing the middle school that the board approved as we're doing the renovation project. So that allow that lets us just the high school that we need to do. And we would like to do the high school when we do the upgrades here. However, there are they are having issues with the controls in the office area here at the high school so we would like to go ahead and be able to move forward to get that at least done and if we do any building renovations up here that would not be impacted so we we would like to get started at least by doing the office areas at a cost of thirty seven thousand six hundred again come out of capital maintenance fund balance we also would like to replace the gooseneck faucets gases gas line um, in our science rooms um, they are currently turned off and not being used um, that is a cost of $21,000, again, to come out of capital maintenance fund balance. Um, this has been on a capital maintenance project list in the past, and it's also in the feasibility study that we could pull out and do on our own, and that's to remove the gym gymnasium carpet and replace with synthetic floor at our James Bird Elementary and Nancy Grayson schools. Um, it is really difficult to disinfect carpeted um, carpet in those areas. So that would be a cost of 60,000, again, to come out of the capital maintenance fund balance, bringing that total to $652,492 out of fund balance. And then under the medium priority projects, um, uh, Mr. Kreitz would at least like to get one of the automated floor scrubbers um, to try out at our high school at a cost of $77,000, especially um, since we have received information that based on our square footage or our building print, we are down five custodians. So technically for all of our square footage, we should have an additional five custodians. This would help ease that burden um, of being short staffed for custodians. And then also uh, to replace a filtration or not replace, to add a filtration or exhaust fan in our art room um, because of the clay dust and pottery um, this has been requested to be put in there, um, and we are still working on the cost for that. Is there any questions on our capital maintenance outlay? I believe the facility committee has seen seen these items and have been prioritized. Uh, <coughs> remind me again what percentage of the camera project will be. 
Remind me again what percentage of the camera project will be funded through grants? Or that's all of it? No. I've seen on the other side here this 354000 yeah, so um, of the 354000 152302 would actually be Shippensburg School District matching that. And the idea was to match it out of current year budget as um, obviously we had money that we weren't going to, or we were going to have leftover money because of the debt service, I believe is what Mr. Burt's idea was, knowing that we were going to have extra funds in the current year budget to help cover that cost. All right, I'm sorry, you said that. I apologize. So that brings us on to our next slide. So sorry, this is uh, tiny to read, so I will read this for you. So we received the Franklin County Career and Technology Center budget for 22-23. And so they are projecting a small increase for Shippensburg Area School District. So our total share for 23-24 school year is $993,565 or an increase of $17,123 to our budget. Um, going down by category. So in terms of operating expenditures, uh, there's an increase to us of 29,286. However, um, last year we had uh, given the VOTEC money towards their capital reserve funding. They actually pulled that out of the budget this year. So that's a decrease of 15,000. And then our share of the uh, uh, VOTEC debt is increasing by 280. $2,837. So that brings again our total share to that 993,565,000 or an overall increase of 17,123. So just today, I actually received information um, from the business manager at the VOTEC, and I understand that this information was shared with the uh, Joint Operating Committee at the last Thursday meeting. So the VOTEC. Annex roof is leaking and has been over the past six to nine months. The original roof was installed in 1978, and this roof has not been included in its 2011 construction and renovation of the building. Uh, the, the repairs are beyond patching at this point, so they are asking school districts to uh, adopt a resolution to either partic participate in the financing or pay our share by, of of this project by cash by August 1st of 2023. So unfortunately, uh, because we are in the process of borrowing and we are borrowing up to that magic uh, $10 million number, we, will, we do not have an option of participating in the financing. Uh, we will have to pay cash because we cannot take on any more debt at this point. So um, we will have to elect to pay our share in cash. However, in speaking with bond council today, um, we can add the Franklin County Area Votech to our 2023 bond issuance resolution that you're set to approve at the upcoming board meeting. That way, if we would be cash strapped and do not want to take this out of our fund balance, we could actually reimburse ourselves through the 2023 bond issuance. So, so I mean, just realistically, it, it allows us to, if we need to, as an option, um, like pay that fund back out of that borrow. Doesn't mean we have to, um, but it is an option, you know, that we can include in that, that uh, decision. So again, it's going to be administration's recommendation to add this for flexibility that if we would need to use the bond issuance to help cover this, although I think we have a pretty healthy fund balance that we, sh we should be okay. Because if you look down below, um, they are estimating Shippensburg's share of the project at $184,920. Keep in mind that doesn't include any cost for change orders should they need to do a change order throughout the, the project. Um, Again, so I believe um, we should be fine, but I would recommend that the board put this um, in as a project in case we would need uh, find ourselves in a hardship that we would want to use the 2020 R Shippensburg Area School District's 2023 bond issuance to pay pay ourselves back. That will be on the discussion agenda at the May meeting, May 8th meeting, and then action at the May 22nd meeting. Okay, so that brings us to our personnel list. So since the last board meeting, um, we've actually made a change to the personnel list. 
So we included items one through three as must have. We have revised the must have list to include um, a part time registrar receptionist. If you recall at the last board meeting, this was on the discussion agenda to split the business office assistant and the registrar into two positions and create a part time district registrar at a cost of actually it's a savings because um, there's actually money in the budget. If you recall, I had asked the board to approve a short term part time um, business mm -hmm. office assistant um, to assist the district. Um, so we can take those monies and apply them to the district registrar. So we'd be able to pull out an $1,946 from the 23-24 budget. We have also added or moved, I should say, moved up on the list, the transportation router planning uh, planner for the district. Again, that would be a savings. We are currently paying $46,000 in routing um, for a part-time position. That'd be 25,463 or a savings of 20,537. Uh, we are also asking for a full-time classroom assistant that could serve as our in-school suspension supervisor at the high school at a cost of $49,384. Um, our executive session item that we would like to talk about after this meeting, a cost to be determined. Adding onto the list a custodian, one cu custodian full-time, although this does not get us to the ideal number of custodians we should have based on the footprint of our buildings, but with adding on to the middle school and uh, recently purchasing an additional administration building, we are asking for at least one full-time custodian to help cover those areas. And we also moved up on the list the bocce coach and assistant coach at a cost of $1,827. So that brings our priority must have list to a minimum of $587,431. And of course the to be determined is the executive session item. And then down below our priority one, um, keeping in mind that we uh, could certainly use a special education teacher at our G Blue school. And then we added to the list of priority one an instructional coast coach. So that brings that subtotal to $197,213. If we were to fund all those, it would cost um, a minimum of $784,644 to the district. Is there any questions on the personnel list? Okay, so I wanted to bring or float an idea before the board um, regarding our per capita revenue. So, um, the reason why I this is kind of coming to you at last minute, um, so we are going to ask the board to seek approval not to collect per capita taxes as an action item on the May 8th agenda. I apologize for the short timing of this uh, new idea. However, um, uh, we had been notified by the borough that they were no longer going to collect the school district taxes. And I had worked with um, our solicitor and our solicitor was working with a borough solicitor um, on research and further discussion of whether the borough would continue to collect these taxes or they would, con they would fall on the school district. Um, I received information probably about a week ago that um, the district will need to move forward with collecting the borough's taxes, well not the borough's, the school district taxes for Cumberland and Franklin County that the borough used to collect on our behalf. So in order to do so, um, the district is gonna need to appoint somebody to collect those borough taxes and we need to do that sooner rather than later. Um, so at the May 8th board meeting, I am going to be putting a tax collector's name on the agenda who has given me tentative that they are willing to try it for um, the, the upcoming school year. However, with a caveat, um, that there is no way our current, one current tax collector could handle both per capita and real estate for the current municipality she collects for, which is Southampton Cumberland, as well as the um, Shippensburg Borough. So I know that there are a lot of surrounding school districts that no longer uh, collect per capita taxes. And I believe one of the reasons is because the collection of the per capita tax is a lot of work, not just for the tax collector, but for district staff as well. So um, 
I know there has been discussions among tax collectors in our district about how little they are paid versus the amount of work it takes them to collect the per capita tax. So, um, so kind of like a give or take, um, if the board would be willing to entertain increasing our real estate taxes to the index or close to the index, um, this would give a little bit of um, financial reprieve um, to the taxpayers in our district if uh, we wouldn't collect per capita taxes. Um, as well as I did a, a comparison here so you can see what per capita revenue brings in for the district. So you can see we budget $125,700, but uh, for the current school year, we have collected in $148,625. When you compare that to the expenses, so we have to pay the tax collectors a dollar per bill, and then there are a number of bills that are exonerated. We're estimating about one eighth, um, not 100% sure of that, um, didn't have time to pull the exact numbers <coughs> on that. And then we also have to pay uh, GSS for the administration uh, software for the per capita taxes. And then when you factor in the printing of the bills, as well as the mailing and postage fees, that brings our expenses to 40,366, which is bringing us down, if the board would agree to not collect this tax, um, a revenue loss to the district of about 108,000. Again, keep in mind, um, I don't have the ability to calculate how much time our staff takes for processing address changes, exonerations, posting of the cash receipts, journal entries, audit spreadsheets, reviewing of the tax bills, the delinquent tax um, collection reporting, the customer service calls we get when they are turned over for delinquent, on and on and on. So there's actually when you factor in all that, the, the revenue loss would be a lot less than that. Um, so when you think about all the nuances that come with collecting the per capita, uh, we are asking the board to consider um, not collecting per capita taxes for 23-24. So a potential win-win, um, you know, depending on where the, the you know, tax increase may came, come from from the school board, this is, is a bit of a give back, but it also is a win for the <coughs> business office um, you know, because it's, it's really kind of a nuisance um, tax to collect. Um, and a nuisance tax to pay as well. Um, it, hence why so many districts have moved away from it. So since this is a new item and we're gonna ask for action at the next meeting because of uh, lining up the tax collector to a point for this position, um, if the board is not willing to entertain this, I'm gonna need to know sooner rather than later as I'm gonna have to look for somebody else to collect these taxes. I just think it's ideal um, that we have a tax collector that's willing to do this because they know the software, they know how to collect taxes. Um, it's going to take a lot to bring someone up to speed to be able to collect those taxes. So I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. So it's approximately $68,000 in lost revenue, but that doesn't include the hassle that and and sort of unknown costs like labor costs of our staff to be involved in that process. Is that correct? Part of that's correct. So instead of sixty eight thousand, it's one hundred eight thousand revenue loss less the the staff's timing that I can't put in that one hundred eight thousand. Oh, the total. Ex oh, you you subtracted the yes. expenses mm -hmm. from the up, yeah. up there. Okay, so one hundred thousand dollars. Do you, you want us to approve the lady to do it this year or not do it at all this year and start? That's what, that's what I'm trying to, you say you have a lady that wants to do it, but then you say you don't want to do it. What, so um, so we are still going to need someone to collect the real estate taxes for the borough, the real estate and per capita. She's willing to take on this responsibility if she doesn't have the responsibilities of the per capita tax. She cannot do both real estate for both counties and per capita for both counties because she already does a large municipality. And is this so, a suggestion for just this year or is this like? So it's, it's it, most likely it would be going forward, but we're not asking the board to completely eliminate it. So in the future, if, if, if we would need to ever reinstitute collecting this tax, we could do so. So it's just, it's just not collecting it. It's not eliminating it. 
it would be setting the per capita rate to zero instead of ten dollars. So we're not eliminating it. We're just setting the per capita rate <coughs> show in the budget. When you set the tax rates for the year, you would set the rate to zero. And then if we'd ever want to collect it in the future, then we have that ability to do so. What local areas don't collect this? I knew you were going to ask me, and I didn't have time to research that today. I definitely know Big Springs one of them, but I can certainly um, research that. I can send an email out to the board before the next board meeting. I can bring that to the next board meeting. That'd be good to know. And there's no question of, I mean, with income taxes, you have to file taxes even if you don't pay taxes, right? But this, this is, and, and, and there's you know consequences for not filing even if you don't owe any money. Um, but this is does not fall into that category, right? So it's not like so. If there's a zero dollar tax bill, then there's no like sort of legal um, necessity to um, like file. send out notices saying, "Hey, you don't have a tax bill." For that is correct. And I did talk to our solicitor today just to make sure this was all okay, and th that he was the one that said you wouldn't eliminate it; you'd set your tax rate to zero. And then obviously we wouldn't be turning anybody over for collections because technically we're not going to send out a tax bill. A nuisance tax anyhow. I mean, it is a nuisance, but I just, it, it, I mean, I, and, I, and I get the, like, the, um, I guess, wisdom of keeping it around in case you wanted to reinstitute it. But man, I can imagine only, only imagine the confusion if at some future date a tax bill shows up and nobody's used to paying this and has any idea what it is. <laughs> My recommendation would not be to collect it in future years, obviously, right. because mean, I, of how difficult it is. That's what I'm hearing. And so I just just as an example, um, these tax bills go out and those like this is just one example. For those people that have their taxes escrowed, they'll turn their per capitas over to the um, mortgage company. This is one we get a lot. And um, the mortgage company won't return them because the mortgage company won't pay the per capita tax, so only pay the real estate tax. So then mortgage company doesn't return it, then guess what happens? You get a delinquent. Yes, and we <coughs> get yelled at a lot um, for these delinquent taxes. And well, as a non-native Pennsylvanian, this has always been a confusing thing to me. I, I, I had no experience with this in any other state I've lived in, and it was... I'm still confused by it. So. It is a tremendous squeeze for, for relatively little juice, um, and our circumstances with our tax collector situation make this kind of a, an opportune time to examine it and, and question. And not just our tax collector. So the person that actually helps assist with the administration end at the district, it's not filled. So the business office assistant position is not filled. And so till that gets filled and trying to get that person trained, I mean, I'm worried about being ready to collect for the upcoming school year. And then just as another example that we get yelled at a lot, um, the tax law protects us. So if for some reason a resident would not receive their per capita tax bill, um, the law protects us because we have no control over the um, United States Postal Service. So if they don't get a bill, they're supposed to know to call in and ask, and a lot of people don't. So again, that's one that gets turned over to delinquent and we get yelled at pretty frequently. It's just a headache all around, just not, not for the, the school district itself, but for our tax collectors as well. Sounds like there's not least any vocal opposition to that proposal and maybe when we get to a future slide it may help a little bit so this slide so when we look at our new revenue projections um, from the last budget finance committee meeting um, starting with column one this is no new personnel request um, we have revenues <coughs> anticipated no tax increase at um, about 60 2.6 million. So when I look at our, have some good news, when I look at uh, where we're trending for our interest income, 
uh, obviously, yes, rates are going up on the debt side, but they're also coming up on the savings side. So I was able to add an additional $250,000 to our interest um, earnings uh, revenue line item. We are also seeing earn, in, earned income tax coming in strong. So I was able to add an additional 100,000 to that revenue line item. Uh, we received good news. We are getting in additional money in our federal program. So we were able to add in um, about 78,000 for Title I revenue. Uh, when we look at our assessed values, I was able to update that, not by much, but by about $9,833. And then just to come to a proposed final budget that I'll need the board to approve Monday, Monday night, um, we went ahead and put in 60% of the governor's budget proposal for um, basic education and special education funding. I think that is a very conservative estimate. I continue to hear that uh, we think that the state legislature will fund at historical levels, maybe even get us close to the governor's budget. Um, but only putting in 60%, we can add an additional 913214 to our state revenue line item. If we would increase taxes to the index, um, that would get us about 1.5 million. And then taking out the per capita, if we discontinue that collection of that tax, we would remove about 108,000. That brings our revenues, including a tax increase to the index of $65.4 million. So then since our last budget finance meeting, we had expenditures at um, 66.2 million. Uh, we have received good news in that our medical rate, we had originally budgeted for a 6.5% increase. That is coming in at a 4.9% increase, so I was able to move, remove $250,000 from expenses. Same way with our dental and vision rates, they are actually mm -hmm. remaining flat. So I was able to remove $15,000 from the dental line item, $1,400 from the vision line item. Uh, we have four retirees. So when I factor in um, a salary adjustment for new um, staff coming in, um, I'm able to pull 100,000 out. But then when I look at um, like benefits, uh, we always budget for uh, family uh, to be on the safe side. So we actually had to increase that line item by 41,500. Um, technology would like to have short-term part-time summer help. Um, at a cost of $10,000. Uh, as I shared with you this evening, the Franklin County Career and Votech increase is 17123 Putting in for our building budget adjustments at $8,865. That brings our expenditure total to about $65.9 million or a deficit of $538,455. Pulling $4,000. 400,000 out of fund balance for our seventh grade teaching positions. That brings us to a deficit, I'm gonna say a manageable deficit of $138,455. So then if we move over to our next column, the must have columns when we put in the personnel request, um, that brings our expenditure total to uh, 66.5 million, adding in $587,431 for those must have positions. That does not include the executive session item. There's no money input in there for that amount yet. That brings our deficit to about 1.1 million. Using fund balance for our seventh grade teaching positions, that brings the deficit to $725,886. Again, that does not include money for the executive session item. So I'm not gonna go into column three, that would be um, those two additional positions that we have in the priority list, but not in the must have list. So uh, I believe that is a very manageable deficit. If you recall for the current school year, we actually projected to use $1.5 million out of our fund balance. And should we get, just let me give you some numbers. If we would get 75% of what the governor proposed, that would be 228,000. Uh, we could add, or if we would get 80%, it would be 304,000. Don't add the two together. Don't add 228,304. I'm just, this is the additional. And if we would get 100% of the governor's budget, that would be an additional 608,826. So again, uh, I think this is a very reasonable projection um, that I feel uh, the board could live with. Um, so I would propose that um, just for the proposed final budget, the board would adopt 
column number two as what we would display for public inspection. And then between the approval of the proposed final budget at our upcoming May meeting and approval of the final budget at our first meeting in June, we can certainly make tweaks to the budget and talk about, you know, is the board comfortable um, increasing taxes to the index or if you would like information on a different scenario. I do have in tonight's presentation uh, one additional scenario to share with you. Um, should we not increase taxes to the index just so you can see how much of a revenue loss that would be. Is there any questions at, that, at this point on the budget summary slide? I, I would just re reiterate that unfortunately we're not going to know what the state's going to do with the budget um, in a timely <coughs> manner. Um, you know, sixty percent I would say is very conservative, um, and you know we remain hopeful, but we don't know, and, and you know that's not a great place to be. Um, but, you know, we we believe we're going to get more, but do you know what it was last year? I don't remember percentage. Yeah, roughly. I don't know. It I wasn't it wasn't last year? Um, didn't they reach like kind of all time highs? We got more than we put in for. I mean, we were conservative in what we put in the budget, and we got more than that in. I can certainly look up those numbers and bring them to to you at the next meeting. With the court case and, and you know where the legislature is, you know, I think that's a, a big factor. Um, there may be some you know, maneuverings politically around some other key issues that may get us more of the governor's <laughs> budget, but not reform in other areas, um, but we're, we're just not gonna know. And with a new governor, that, that timeline's even longer. Okay, so you've seen this slide before, but I just wanted to bring back and share with you. If there is no tax increase, again, that's a revenue loss of about 1.5 million. Uh, what does that look like for our taxpayers? So here we go. This again highlights the equalization uh, being in a split county. Um, although we say we're not going to increase taxes, our Cumberland County residents, they're, let's just look at the median assessed value uh, for comparison purposes. So median assessed value in Cumberland County of 170700 uh, Our Cumberland County uh, property owner would see their tax bill go up by about $26.77. On the Franklin County side, when you look at the median assessed value of $19,340, I say that there's no tax increase, but their tax bill is actually gonna go down by $50.90. Okay. The, the joys of dual county school districts. It doesn't make any sense. It's bonkers, this is what, my sixth time looking at this makes no more sense than it did then. Yeah, that, I mean, my understanding is Franklin County hasn't reassessed since 1961. One. And that's part of it, but there's more. I cannot speak to the intricate details of the law. Um, Tim Schrom from PASBO had come in and spoke to us, <coughs> and he certainly is a good advocate for us. Um, between him and Hannah Barrick at PASBO, um, they are leading this effort. Um, but. There is a lot of intricate details in the legislation that just that whole equalization that needs to be fixed. And they are trying to do that for us school districts. At least we're not that one school district that has like, how many is it like four? four? It's in four counties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it could be worse. <laughs> Always look on the bright Nathan, side. Nathan, could you imagine what it would look like? Thank then? you. <laughs> Silver lining. Yep. <clears throat> So I can certainly run more scenarios if the board gives me guidance, but just so you could see, um, if the board would do a tax increase uh, to 4.9% instead of the 5.4%, that would be a revenue loss to the district of about $187,000. And what would that look like to our taxpayers? Again, just focusing on the median assessed value, the Cumberland County resident would see their tax bill go up by about $133. And on the Franklin County side, median assessed value of 19,340, they would see their tax bill go up about $38.42. And then if we would increase taxes to the index, again, just focusing on the median assessed value, Cumberland County residents would see their tax bill go up about $147.77. And the Franklin County would see their um, tax bill go up by about $50.84.
So, on to some good news. Um, when looking at potential future economic growth, um, we, uh, well, I should say we, Joanne, um, had reached out to our counties as part of uh, being ready to do uh, the rating call for our bond issuance that's up and coming. And so in doing this research, uh, we've heard from Southampton Franklin that they have approved <coughs> plans for an 800,000 square foot warehouse. So it's the construction has not started yet, but the plans have been approved. So we're feeling pretty good that I'm not sure when the construction would be done, definitely not this fiscal year, but either in a year or two, um, we could anticipate additional revenues of 350,000. They are also aware of another 400,000 square foot warehouse uh, proposed f there at the crossroads of Woods Road and Old Scotland Road to be built within the next two years, estimating revenue from that warehouse at about 175,000. We are also aware in Southampton Cumberland, there's a 48 apartment complex going up there's a potential for a warehouse on seven acres and a possible housing development of 365 houses on Baltimore Road. Again, I don't have um, numbers, estimates for those, but again, that would be increased real estate tax revenue to the district in the future. There's a that will actually cost us money. Which one? For the children. So, yeah. so the, well, that, the that's, warehouses that's are the a little part. more... That's the scary part. Are, uh, so, so I believe those are built into our projections from EI because um, they would have been within that study. There's um, a, an apartment complex in South um, Southampton, Franklin, also. Okay. Definitely the where the warehouse. Yeah, obviously there were mixed mixed uh, benefits and drawbacks to, to warehouses. Um, however, from the school district budget perspective. Um, you know, revenue without additional students um, gives us a little bit of breathing room. And to your point, Mr. Suters, you know, the, the revenue with additional potential students, you know, kind of negates it a little bit. All right, so I uh, can keep referring to this uh, legislative changes, a resolution. Um, so PASBO is active and um, in order to advocate for school districts, they are asking us multi-county school districts or the school boards of multi-county school districts to approve a resolution that they have drafted um, that would allow <coughs> them to continue to advocate for this legislative change. So this is just a snapshot of the resolution. It will be placed on the May 8th agenda for discussion and then we'd ask that you take action on this at the May 22nd meeting so we can help support PASBO in their efforts to advocate change to the equalization um, calculation for us multi-county school districts. So nothing, this has nothing to do with the 23-24 um, budget. However, I wanted to provide information to the board. Um, obviously, um, our high school prom is this weekend. And unfortunately, the two approved security vendors are unable to provide coverage um, for our event. So we are looking at um, contracting with new level security. However, they want us to sign an agreement. And with the prom being this Saturday, we haven't had the ability or had a meeting to be able to have the board approve this agreement. So we wanted to bring this to your attention that this would show up as retroactive approval at the May 8th board meeting. D don't love retro uh, approvals, um, you know, but in this case, you know, we need security at the prom and you know, getting this in front of you here allows you to at least to ask questions. Who are they? Uh, it's new level security. Um, Did you say out of Waynesburg? Cater, the Cater, the Cater family. Are drones people from Harrisburg? Hmm? Are drones, drones pe caters people? Or who, who is it? Um, well, if I say that, I, I can't I can't think of the father's name, but Nyla Cater. Uh, drone, drones company. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. towns, yeah. Yes. Okay. I believe they're here local in Shippensburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a local vendor that we're using. And, and normally this could be an invoice thing, but you know, signing a contract with them gives us another option. When our first two approved can't can't help us. And who were the two that couldn't do it? Uh, Shad Security and um, 
GeForce are the two approved vendors. So that brings us to our closing remarks. Um, I will be doing a presentation on our food service department, uh, their budget and their equipment needs, as well as the summer food service program at our committee of the whole meeting on May 22nd. In terms of a budget timeline, again, we would ask that the board approve a proposed final budget at our May 8th meeting. Again, going back to the summary slide, I'm gonna back up. Oops, Carrie might need to help me. This one? No, go back. Keep going. There, wait, yes. <laughs> so again, um, asking the board to approve the, the middle column that says total priority one must have personnel list. Um, this is what that I would put into the, the PDE 2028 format um, for, a, for public inspection. So it would include 60% of the governor's budget. It would include um, the maximum going to the uh, worst case scenario going to the index and then the removal of the per capita expense, um, real estate real estate, the per capita tax bills. And then of course, you know, the expenditures at 66.5 uh, million showing <coughs> an initial deficit of 1.5, using fund balance uh, 400,000 for the seventh grade teachers, then it would show a revised deficit of the 725,886 to be taken out of fund balance. Um. Mrs. Everly and I would like to request that we use a different abbreviation for the Committee of the Whole meetings. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on that. We'll throw a T in there. <laughs> we'll do that. So then um, we would ask that the board approve the final budget no later than June 12th. So we can certainly have discussions between the May 8th and the June 12th meeting um, for changes to the proposed final budget. Um, in order to accomplish this, we'd like to have a standalone budget and finance committee meeting again on June 5th at 6 p.m. to hash out the final budget for approval. And then we would like to go into executive session following tonight's meeting for personnel and negotiations. And then that leaves if there's any further questions or comments or guidance that you would like to provide us in terms of the budget. I am not in favor of going to the inbox. I know everybody says we're leaving money on the table, but it's the money in the pockets of the residents. That's what it is, too. Understood, Mr. Hughes. Thank I'm you. Not, I was never in favor of a zero. <laughs> but, well, but definitely not to the index. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask the question. Um, still being relatively new to this, let's just say like Mr. Suter said, he wasn't in favor of to the index, and I'm not saying where I stand out on that, but if you don't want zero and you don't want to the index, how do you pick a number then? Go ahead. I was just gonna say, kind of like if you guys can come to an agreement at the board level and share that thought with administration so we can build that in. So, so I mean, it really just becomes, you know, so we've identified the priorities of the priorities, um, you know, with a lower than index number, you know, we, we would look to trim those, um, you know, to try to, you know, get that deficit down as far as we can while still getting the positions that we, we need to get. So it, it just becomes a, a more difficult right. decision to make on those areas that we have some leeway on. So and some of it, one other thing that we we are always compare what uh, other schools do with uh, money, how much they spend for a pupil, and maybe it's shame on them because we're doing better with less. Because I I would put our students up against anybody. Yeah, without without a doubt, I, our students and and staff um, do do, do a great job. You know, we we still want to support them and make sure they have the resources and the opportunities that, that you know, we want them to have. So I, um, 
It's hard to say things like money solves all the problems. Um, as I mentioned that to Mr. Suters the other day, he said with more money comes more problems. And I, I suppose, um, I, and I'll concede such truisms, but it seems to me that the kinds of things that we um, get, uh, the, th the kinds of things that get the most attention, that sort of bring about the most frustration, the things that we argue about the most, uh, these are things that are related to like a lack of money to spend. Um, we have recently had several conversations about custodial services. We've had conversations about uh, demands on counseling. We were having conversations about how many classrooms are appropriate and how number of teachers to have. We've had conversations about special education coverage. We have had in the past conversations about reading specialists and the need for reading specialists and continue to hear from uh, teachers uh, about the need for reading and math specialists. Uh, all of these things are reoccurring expenses. I mean, we argue a lot about facilities too, but, or I shouldn't say argue, we, we discuss the uh, facility concerns a lot as well. But all of the issues that I've just described, including, well, I, I, let, let me not limit that. We've also talked about um, the desire for more um, uh, um, security, more SROs in our schools. All of these things are reoccurring expenses uh, that don't get taken care of with when the budget is reduced. Um, so it seems to me that the, you know, the high, I mean, we're not, we're not going to be able to solve all those problems anyway, but the higher we can get our operating revenues, uh, the more opportunity we have to address some of these very real concerns, which are the things that cause us the most headaches and frustrations and <coughs> stress. And, and to your point, Dr. Goetz, it's not about closing the gap in one budget cycle, um, but really asking the question of what can we accomplish in, in this cycle, um, you know, and, and wh where have we placed our values, budgets are valued based documents, um, you know, so we've, we've tried to outlay, out, outline, you know, the things that we value and, and prioritize on a number of different areas. Um, and, and certainly there's room for discussion around that. And, you know, th there are some hard decisions that the board will need to, to wrestle with for sure. And I'll just also add one more point that with the yeah, inflationary environment that we are in, um, it's just a reality that we are going to be behind the curve in uh, the salaries to our contracted employees, uh, both of our, you know, the employees under our union contracts and our administrative contracts as well. Um, and uh, we need to prepare for that in future contracts because it's like the wave hit and we're sort of a little bit behind the wave, but we're gonna have to keep up. Otherwise, we're gonna have bigger problems down the road. Thank you, Mrs. Lentz, for all of your preparation uh, and uh, for answering our questions. Uh, and um, yeah, I'd all of it. just would like to thank Christiane, she is blood, sweat, and tears on this document in terms of, of how much time and effort it takes to gather the information and put it into a format. So thank you, Christy. All right, so if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we will uh, adjourn this meeting and we will adjourn to an executive session to um, discuss uh, some personnel slash contract issues.